I will be uh, moderating. I'm hoping you brought all of your questions to the table. So go ahead and get those uh, typed in as we go along and do our introductions. And I'll have, um, I'll start with you, James. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. I'm James Hughes. Uh, I'm an architect in central Arkansas. Uh, for the past five years, I've worked with ATG. Predominantly, what I do is services-based, uh, Revit trainings, advanced and beginner trainings. Uh, and then we also do some level of support too. So if you ask any of the really hard questions, a tier one person uh, does some research and, and tries to resolve your question. If not, it comes to probably one of us. And that may, may be already over promising. We may not know the answer to your questions, but we will try. We normally have the luxury of doing a little bit of research to get back to someone. Uh, here it'll be a little bit more off the hip, uh, but this is kind of what we do. And uh, so that's who I am. I'm James Hughes, architect. Michael, you wanna go next? Yeah, I'll go next. So my name is Michael Chave. I'm an AEC technical specialist here. Uh, been at ATG for about a year now. My primary background is in structural design. Um, my experience was with training for structural design. I also have some experience in architectural design as well. Uh, Brian Weeks. Um, I have also been in the field of architecture for uh, 20 years. Project architect, project manager, uh, BIM manager, uh, all of those uh, uh, titles. And uh, at ATG, I've been with them uh, a year now and uh, senior AEC technical specialist. So, um Feel free to type in those questions um, if you have anything else. If not, I do have some questions that um, were sent in ahead of time. So that way, you know, in case anyone didn't have anything. So, um, and we were just kind of chatting before we got started here about some of the different topics. So James, you were talking about bringing in um, CAD details. Um, so, and I feel like you had an opinion on probably the best workflow or best practices on that. So. Uh, until we get some other questions uh, coming in, we can start with that one. Sure, yeah, bring them in and, and explode them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. That is, that is the worst practice that uh, in some places that'll get you fired. So be aware of that. Uh, you should not do that. Uh, so there's basically two main reasons that at least the architects that I'm training with are going to bring in details or bring in CAD files. Uh, option number one or, or workflow number one is if you're bringing in a floor plan to model on top of, and that's actually a different workflow than if you're bringing in details to kind of supplement your, uh, to supplement your construction administ or your uh, construction document set. So if you're bringing in a floor plan, normally you're just going to link that CAD file, uh, place it in the floor plan that you need to model on top of. And uh, a lot of times people will select that CAD file uh, and, and I'm sorry, when they import it in, they, they keep it as black lines instead of uh, retaining the color value whenever you get that option. Uh, and then you can select that CAD file, make sure it's pinned and then right click on it and choose to uh, override the graphics in the view. And a lot of people will make that like blaze red or orange or some kind of vibrant color because whenever you start to model those black and white Revit elements on top of it, then it, it sort of uh, sits on top of and hides that colorful line, makes it really easy at a glance to tell what you have and have not done yet. And then sometimes you need to uh, override the graphics so you can see through the Revit walls to see, you know, windows and things that are underneath. And so you might need to toggle to wireframe from time to time to do that. Uh, the second workflow that uh, people bring in CAD files for a lot is for your standard details. You know, if you're doing, if you've got, uh, 10 roofing details that you're trying to bring in from Ziplast or, or whoever, or you've just developed them over time. There's still people that are transitioning from AutoCAD that use their standard AutoCAD wall sections. Uh, and so they will link those in. So again, you're linking a CAD file, uh, converting it to black and white. Uh, if you were, and we recommend that people basically start to a plan to convert those CAD assets over to Revit assets over time, if it's a standard detail, and you want to replace those CAD lines with uh, detail components. You know, for instance, like your two by fours or your, uh, your metal studs, you want to use detail components because that allows you to change your mind about how a detail's framed out and you just select those, change it, uh, you know, to a different stud member uh, on the fly. And, and so you want to do that. 
And if you do the conversion, I know I'm way over answering the question here, but if you do the conversion, that is the one time that you bring in a detail and explode it, but never, ever, ever into your project. You do that into a proxy file. So you'd open up a dummy project. I call mine explosion zone when I do this. That way I know what's up. I know exactly what's happening in there. Uh, I bring that CAD file in, I explode it, and I use the standard company line uh, styles and uh, all of the standard stuff that I need to fix or, or uh, well, fix the detail up, make sure it's got the right text and dimensions, uh, and then overlay with detail components. When I finish, I will do a window across all of those Revit assets that I've created, copy it, and then open my project and paste that into a blank drafting detail. And that, that way, only the clean Revit components come over and none of the junk that uh, invades your Revit file when you explode it comes over. So sorry to over answer. I'll be quiet on the next one. No, no, that's no. great. No, that's, I, I was going to say, James, too, since you're on a roll, and why, and we've had this discussion many times, why don't you want to do that? And we've had this issue on projects you and I have worked on for other architects. Why don't you want to bring those in and explode them or, or bring one in and leave it? What, what happens when that, right. when you do that? So, don't do it. Here's why. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, to be honest, part of uh, we partly make a living cleaning up behind people that made that mistake. I mean, we have to help people to create a template file because they have one from two years ago that has exploded junk inside of it. Uh, some of the junk, and, and I might be talking a little bit over my head here, but some of the junk that happens is basically whenever you have a CAD file and you explode that, every one of those layers now invades your project as a, uh, I believe is a line style. And you can, you can remove some of that, but there's also metadata that, uh, and uh, geometry that ends up exploding and becoming part of your .rbt file. And my understanding is you cannot get rid of most of that stuff without using third party software. So it's a big boo-boo, like you need to redo your template if you've exploded a detail inside of it. Because the chance for corruption basically compounds. Uh, the more that you've got those types of elements in a project, and I'm sure a lot of the people joining us have had a project that got corrupt. Uh, and a lot of them got a project that got so corrupt, they couldn't get inside of it. And, you know, a lot of times that's Revit City stuff, but sometimes, man, that's just bad project hygiene or Revit hygiene where you've, ex you've allowed team members to explode uh, elements. And if they do that in the company template, man, every one of your projects starts with that stuff uh, inside of it. So it, it's kind of a big no-no. Or that's it exactly. Are you going to see any performance issues um, if you're in that transition phase? Maybe you're fairly new to Revit and you're linking in some sheets for CAD. At what point are you going to see any kind of performance issue by having excessive CAD links? I've got an answer, but I'm gonna let somebody else swing at it first. <laughs> I can. Uh, so immediately i mean what happens is it ca it really cascades because once you uh insert uh, a cad dwg and you can insert it draw over it and then you hide it or it's still there in the view but it's hidden and then you duplicate the view for something else now you've duplicated everything that's in it including your dwgs and if that happens multiple times uh, we just worked on a project that was a casino hotel and they were having that same issue and it was multiple floors. Uh, I don't remember how, how tall their hotel was, 50, 60 floors, something like that. And so they duplicated their floor that they drew on and it had hidden DWG uh, content in it. And then that duplicated and it grew and it grew. And uh, I think that I was trying to remember they had their model separated into eight different parts, say eight, eight different linked Revit models and each Revit model as it came together was, was an eight gig, James, does that sound right? Like an what? eight gig Revit model? Yeah, I was going to ask and you. And it still is operating? <laughs> how Bare, Barely. <laughs> we, we're working on our BIM boxes, so that helped. Uh, on, right, so Brian, you're running a BIM box. How long did it take you just to open up that fragment of the project with, with just those work sets on? It still took to, a while, right? It, with all the, when we first got to the project with all the work sets, they had 30-plus uh, work sets, which is another 
topic for that's a whole class you could teach on work and how to use work sets but it was 30 some odd work sets and it would take 35 to 40 minutes and I have a i9 I have an i9 processor bin box with 64 gig uh, you know it I'm and, sorry, and that's not funny it's <laughs> not and that was the first couple of days our whole team was trying to figure out what's going on we dug into it we used our CTC tools to analyze the project uh, we were able to analyze and look at all the links and it, it basically told us everything that was going on within the model. So we were able to determine that there were so many work sets within each of the eight Revit models that then were linking together. And so when we'd open even just one of those eight models, every one of them was interlinked to each other. And so we would have to, you know, we, we, we learned the hard way after that first couple of days we shut all the work sets off and, and open specific work sets and then we could get it open within 10 minutes or so. so let me, let me kind of dial it down one notch in case Brian lost some of you guys specifically what we're talking about is if you link in a CAD asset, so it's linked, it's not, you didn't actually embed the CAD file inside the Revit. Revit still has to follow a path, find a file and refresh itself with that data. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you put too many of those links in your project, which we already said link don't embed, but if you do it too much, then Revit has to look at 20 different locations and verify that the files actually are there before it will show you the screen. Uh, and we and were so working off of a cloud, so it took even longer because all those were cloud shared with the, with the company there in, in uh, Arizona and uh, Nevada. So, so, I, so I try not to link too much, but I've heard feedback from people that basically say that a project will go along running normal and, and you can pan and do, and do saves at a normal pace and somewhere over 20 links is going to cause a sudden problem. Like you can just link one or two too many times and then Revit will really misbehave for them. So it's not, it's not as gradual as you would expect either. And that kind of leads into um, a question that just came in the, the chat window with regards to performance. Um, what is the acceptable file size for a Revit project? Uh, 500 meg, uh, any possible issues with breaking up the models? You want to talk a little bit about that? Michael's turn. <laughs> so what I've seen from uh, my research, usually what you have for your template size, you want to keep it around 10 megabytes, right? It's usually the size you want to have for a, a generic template size. Try to keep a little bit under that. Um, and from what I've seen just from my research also in talking about performance issues and what type of computer you need to optimize Revit software, um, usually around 300 megs for your schematic phase, your DD phase is around a good size for a model. Anything that you start to see exceed past that, you're having some issues, right? Some compounding issues that you need to start investigating, do some, um, a lot of research into, uh, into what may be happening to implode the size. Are people exploding details? Um, are there too many links, things being copied? Are our renderings in our model versus being linked in, right? So we can have all these kind of thoughts of why is our model size being more or larger, right? I agree with everything Michael said. I've got a dumber, less technical answer, which is your computer, however crummy it is, if it's within the last 10 years, should be able to wield any kind of a reasonable sized Revit project. And let me qualify that by saying, if your computer chugs, if it's you know being herky-jerky with that, it is one of the issues that Michael mentioned, uh, or it also, let me add one more to that, you could have too much geometry inside of elements that you've brought in. You know, if you see a beautiful live oak tree on Revit City and you plunk it down in the site and you say, that's beautiful, and you put 10 more down there, you will blow up your project. Uh, just that one action can do that. Uh, and there's also people that have downloaded furniture. I know someone that uh, got something, I think it was from, well, I shouldn't say, a, a manufacturer, a very popular interior design uh, outfit that makes furniture. And whenever their bin manager looked at it, they had over 2,500 materials baked into that chair. And it, there were only like five finishes that it needed. And so you can end up with manufacturer's content that's bloated as well. So make sure you watch that as it comes into your shop. And then let me add one other comment too, kind of on top of that layer upon layer. Uh, working in an architecture field, I know that our process is, is, you know, we do a schematic design and typically we'll, here, I'll look at my camera so you're not seeing the side of my face, typically we'll develop 
a schematic design and then you do your layouts and a lot of times you will work with your client on multiple design options which Revit thankfully has that capability the bad part is is that uh, a lot of time that workflow stays the same on every project the architecture firm does whether it's a small project a, a small tenant renovation all the way up to a multi-story hotel and so then what happens is when you have those design options and you do furniture layouts you do finishes you do wall layouts and you have multiple design options within that shell that you're showing your client regrettably most of the time there is not time for the project manager to clean that up and so what happens is that will follow through your whole process and if you have a two three four year project that that is being developed all that kind of gets drug along with it and it and it creates larger files so typically what i suggest is workflow for smaller projects it's fine to keep that uh, keep some of the graphic or the design options within it but if you're going to larger projects with a longer time frame at once that design option is approved uh, which again regrettably for architects that's usually right before construction but once that's approved to save a new model clear out everything that's not needed and now you've got a clean model that's based off of that one design option so you, if you go yeah, ahead I'm sorry i thought you were through I, I i was i was just gonna say if that's a if that's possible a lot of times to architects time-wise it's not possible so you've, you've got three ways to fix it if you have a project that's chugging uh, you and everybody wants to jump to option C, which is well, this is proof I need a new computer, I need a BIM box, <laughs> which, which maybe you do, I don't know. But you've got two other options too that you should check before that. Number one is, uh, and, and Brian's already hit on this with the casino project, try to utilize work sets so that your computer's not lifting the entire project. Now, you should only have to do that if you've got like a large hospital or some kind of multi wing size uh, building. If you've got something that you would not say it has wings or it is not of a certain square footage that we're just chopping it up with match lines everywhere, uh, then you shouldn't have to utilize work sets to help manage the project. If it's still chugging, then it's probably the other thing, which is model hygiene. And if you have a BIM coordinator on staff, that's their job to like, you know, check in on these projects and see what's happening. And then eventually, not to put too fine a point on it, figuring out who's doing stuff uh, and, and what they can do to sort of train against that or to uh, you know, make sure that people aren't running out and grabbing objects that aren't tested or, or ready to use. So those are your three things you can do. Model hygiene is, is usually the culprit. Second is utilize work sets to subdivide the project. Third is get yourself a BIM box and you will never look back. <laughs> so are there any recommendations and, and of those three, um, if that doesn't resolve it, uh, breaking up the model. At what point do you, you know, kind of throw in the towel and decide, okay, maybe we need to, to split that. Is there a recommendation or um, what, what makes that determination? When is a good time to break up? I only like to do it in the planning stage. I don't like to impose work sets after the model's already underway because if you're doing it reactively, you're probably going to create a lot of friction with the design team. Uh, mm -hmm. But you, you guys may have some other opinions on, you know, how, to, how you approach saying, okay, well, this is big enough. So we're, normally it's geographically. Normally you look at it and say, well, this is going to be the left side. This will be the right side. Or, or you'll kind of figure out a north, south, east, west, or however you carve it up. Normally it's geographically. Okay. And, and it invo involves pre-planning project manager, architect, project architect, uh, and, and, your, and, your, and making sure your team follows that directive. Uh, it comes down to pre-plan. Yeah, because they're also going to help spread out for not just architecturally specifically, but also subs, right? So you All your consultants. Design, MEP, mm -hmm. So that needs to be done beforehand. So not only they're not lagging behind, also the subs aren't, right? All right, so next up from Levi, um, for Revit projects, do you recommend architectural site plans be drawn in Revit or AutoCAD? If Revit, do you have a proven workflow which utilizes shared coordinates and or Dynamo scripts? This is, this is a very popular question. Architectural site plans, how do we handle them? That's a hard one too, because uh, because of the balance between the when you when you're in Revit, 
Revit is a modeling software. Now, of course, we're developing 2D drawings uh, based off of that model, but to model, and, and this is just from my experience, to try to model a site in 3D in Revit usually doesn't make a whole lot of sense time-wise because of the development that goes into it. Now, I'm not experienced with Civil 3D, and I know that that's just been released some updates on that, and so there may be more uh, more that it can do than regular just Revit can. But Revit really to me as an architect is is primarily a 2D, 3, or a 3D modeling creating 2D drawings. So my recommendation and, the, and everyone's got different ex work experience too, but my, my experience has been to, to import, if you're doing an architectural site plan, maybe you're taking your civil plan that typically is in AutoCAD and then you've got to add stuff to it or add notes for your architecture or you do some, uh, some masking overlays to shade buildings and things of that nature. I, uh, I would link it. I typically link it and then and do all my 2D sheet work over the top of it. Yeah, and, and I see that too. And, I, and I've worked at firms that just straight up take the civil engineer's CAD file and plunk it down flat right there on the floor plan and then duplicate the view and call it a site plan. And then they will add uh, line work if they really have no fee <laughs> to indicate walkways or whatever architectural site elements need to be added. Uh, a better workflow for that is actually to um, basically generate a topo surface inside of Revit from it. So if you receive a CAD file from a civil engineer or a surveyor, normally your thought process is, well, they made this in AutoCAD. It's not even a BIM software. It almost certainly is. They almost certainly created that in Civil 3D. And so it actually does have Z value to the topography in it. It contains geodetically located data or coordinates inside of it or real world coordinates. And all you have to do is link that CAD file in like Brian said, but if you take it one step further, you can actually create or generate a topo surface from the uh, CAD file that you've linked. And, uh, and it, you just basically tell it to look at the major and minor topo layers and Revit will generate a topo surface that will show up in any section that you cut as an intelligent uh, mass of ground. And then if you need to punch down, uh, you can create, um, you can create a, what do they call it? The, uh, the building pads. Sorry, I'm That's what up. it is. It's Found a building it. pad. Yeah. Yeah. So you just use a, yeah, you just use a building pad uh, command inside of Revit to punch down uh, for your building itself. And you can actually uh, do cut and fill analysis with that as well. I've, I've seen some workflows where you can take that topo surface that you've generated and then look at the volume that you might be subtracting from it and where you might fill that. And you can actually get uh, accurate volume data from that. Uh, so that's, that's kind of why that's a better workflow. Plus any elevation or section that you cut that shows the site is going to be accurate. And that's very valuable to an architect instead of just looking at it from plan view only and having a flat uh, two-dimensional representation of the site. And that allows you to model your walkways accurately so that they are following the contours of the surface instead of you just guessing, uh, which actually wastes a lot of time. It's actually faster to model it uh, accurately. Are there any drawbacks, uh, kind of a follow-up question to this, on performance for having uh, the topo surface in the, in the model? Are there any best practices to maybe just put it on a work set to control the visibility? Um, if you needed to turn that off as well? I tend to work on architectural projects that aren't big enough. I mean, they're not, you know, a square mile or more of, but if you've got a large civil project, yeah, you might have an issue. But if you've got any, and I've worked on, you know, projects that are larger than a city block and still, I wouldn't say that the topo surface added um, too much unwieldiness to the Revit experience, but a lot of people will put that on its own work set so that you can choose whether or not it's on or not. And possibly uh, maybe even an option uh, in ProWorks for site, site modeling. Has anyone dabbled in leveraging that software as well? I, I have you. not. I have okay. not. Okay, I know our civil team um, has to a certain degree, but. Uh, Throw us down a peg. I know, I'm <laughs> sorry. Womp womp, sorry about that. But. Uh, yeah, that's something that we work on on our other civil site. Uh, yeah, and we we do have ATG does have uh, we do have techs that that ha have used that. 
just the three of us are uh, we're kind of architectural specialists uh, more so than civil. Okay. Um, just want to make sure I get all the questions and, and some of them look to be sort of on the same line. So I'm going to skip over to Janice's question. Um, and you can see other people chatting as well um, with other recommendations too, but what is a recommended practice and MP for detailing with uh, multi-floor and living unit building with similar units without placing devices in every unit on every floor. I know we don't have anyone MEP specific, but maybe just uh, in your experience with Can you repeat the question again? Yeah, you caught yeah. me. I was reading chat with a different question while you yeah. were asking okay. that. Okay, all right. Um, what is a recommendation for MEP for dealing with Multi-floor and living unit buildings. Um, was, so basically, an um, MPD like apartment, uh, similar units without placing devices in every unit on every floor. So, Group, right. Groups. Okay. Revit groups. If you create groups for, you can do it for furniture layouts, MEP layouts, electrical units, you know, uh, in my past working on hotels and apartments, yeah. Yeah. you would, you would create a basic unit and, uh, and, and just, and you'd create a group out of it. And that one unit would have all your uh, furniture, you basically would model that one unit. So you'd have your two bedroom, your one bedroom, three bedroom, you know, whatever, you would model just that individual unit as a group. And then you can then copy that group with those individual components within those families within that group. And you can rearrange and rotate and move and, and then you can assign those to, you know, multiple floors. There's a whole lot you can do, but by grouping all that, uh, it, it creates a, you know, a, a standard for that one room, that one bedroom, one bath, and then then if you have to change something, uh, we're, we're changing to, you know, uh, a wall mounted instead of a floor mounted toilet or whatever aspect you need to change, you just change it in that one group and it changes all those groups where you've copied it to. Brian, let me add to that. I agree with you. Groups is probably the best way to tackle that. Um, as I'm doing trainings or surveying people about their use of groups, there's a lot of people hating on groups because they have tried to do things and it didn't perform for them and they ended up ungrouping it and making a mess. Uh, and so if you've done that, uh, be careful with it. And some of the things you need to realize is that if you've got any elements within your group that are hosted by an element, that host element does have to be a part of your group. And sometimes that causes weirdness. If you're repeating, you know, a wall within the group, well, now I, I'm going to end up with a wall on top of wall condition. And so normally if you've got a wall mounted light, for instance, you do have to make that uh, a different type of family. You might actually have to take that family and then grab the geometry and the uh, parameters you need out of it and create a new family that is not wall hosted. That's just generic. And as you create that and you place it, it might drop it on the floor or do something weird you didn't expect, but it won't now be hosted by the wall and you don't have to include the wall in the group. The other thing I want to point out is that most people don't realize you can kick elements out of a group on an individual basis. So if, if I'm repeating a typical unit and then I get to the end of the hallway and the hallway is a different corridor system or it's got a closet or something that messes up my group formation, then I can actually just kick out some of the elements that change that don't fit the profile in that condition after I've already placed it and I don't ungroup everything and lose the powerful effect of having it grouped. And, I know I use yeah. my hands to explain that. <laughs> you need to look into it. If you've given up on groups, you need to give them another look. Yeah, and, and what about the, the file size? I keep going back to the file size because in my previous Revit life, you know, and someone, uh, Sonia said that they can ca cause the file to float and sometimes you get groups inside of groups and then arrayed. I've even seen arrayed families in nested inside of a group and that just pretty much put a halt. So I think you have to be very intentional and um, make sure that it really does make sense that you're using groups because if you just go crazy, you're going to float your file size again. So where do you find that balance? Well, it, to, for me, I mean, things that I've seen is it actually comes down to what you're doing within those groups because uh, to get down into the coding of, of Revit and how file size grow is 
Revit tracks the individual items within your model through a number, through through a, a hex code, uh, like something similar. Number. Yes, yeah, thank GWID. you. That was that was GWID. That was it. And so, as long as that element doesn't change, it's only referenced by that one. So when you group, uh, you're grouping multiple elements into a group, but then that group receives a number. And that one number refers to that group. So even if you have multiple groups, if they're all the same number, it's just referencing that one number, that one code. It's when you start multiplying and having uh, duplicating groups or copying groups, you copy paste a group instead of inserting a group. A copy paste creates a new code. An insert duplicates the code. I just so, learned something. I've always been copying them around. If I'm you, like, copy, if you copy, right, you yeah, better if, not go overboard. Yeah, if you copy paste a group, you're actually generating a new group. And then if you go through your group pull down, it'll be assigned a new number. So you'll have mm. group A furniture, group B furniture. Well, I copy paste to group A. Now I have group A parentheses, A per close parentheses of a new group, which is a new code. And then yeah. therefore I've now duplicated everything that's within that group just by copy pasting rather than going up to model insert. So there's some, there's some background stuff there, but um, I don't think, and for whatever reason, well, I know what reason I was gonna say, for whatever reason, uh, grouping and stuff is not as bad as DWG insertions. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because with DWG insertions, all those lines, every line that you've just inserted and every patch that you've just inserted, or if you explode a hatch and now you've got 10,000 little marks from your concrete hatch that you just exploded, every single one of those You're has fine. a code associated. Yeah, every one of those has a code associated to it. So every time there's more code generated, the file gets bigger and bigger because yeah. Revit has to store that code to track what that item is. Okay. On the same lines of with groups, um, you know, would it be better if you're dealing with a group of furniture that's going to be repeated multiple times on a project? Would you do that with a model group or a family with all of that furniture inside of it? Is there a, a best practice or recommendation on that? So we're talking about nested families, correct? It would be, yeah, because you would have families inside. So maybe you have a typical um, oh, operating room layout. If I'm talking about equipment instead of furniture, it would apply. Um, would you, is it better to have those individual pieces or one family that has all of them nested inside of it? I've, I've always worked and I haven't done a lot of interiors work. Uh, normally that's interior designers doing that. Uh, but recently we've, you know, Brian and I've been working on a project where they've created model groups for different layouts. So they've got individual pieces of furniture and then they've taken three, four pieces and created a cluster of them, you know, for a lounge or whatever kind of is, is a typical layout. And then they do a group of that furniture. Uh, and so that has been really helpful uh, for us to be able to place that. Uh, with COVID-19, there's kind of new desk spacing. Some of you guys will probably start dealing with that as designers. Uh, and so we've got desks spaced further apart and we requested that they actually do an edit to the family file and give us a dashed line, almost like a clearance around the desk. Because then when you have that and you're creating these layouts of desks, you can just grab them, go corner to corner, snap it and put together formations really easily that way. So I've done it both ways, uh, both baked into a family file and uh, as a grouped element, and they're, they're both easy. Uh, and, and as long as you're not creating, I, I would say, if you're creating more than 40 or so groups, you really need to look at how much, like to your point, Emily, how much do I actually need this? And the question I ask for myself is, is this model group actually helping as a force multiplier for me? Or am I only using this group in like two or three places where I could actually just copy it around? Yeah, and that comes back to the question, if. The group is more the instance of the project. The family is more global. Am I going to use this on additional projects? So why not create the yeah. family ahead of time that I can use on multiple projects moving forward versus the group, which is just the project basis? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to group a couple questions together um, with regards to visualization. Um, and I kind of have, uh, I'm going to throw in my own questions here. 
but um, you know, what do you recommend about putting entourage? And I feel like we're talking a lot about today about like you know file size, performance, bloating. So if you want to talk about recommendations for entourage, as well as you know, if you want to talk about materials and rendering, um, Inkscape for virtual reality best best practices on that. So maybe just visualization as a whole. Any recommendations for materials? and entourage. Inkscape is making some waves uh, for architects. Uh, that one's definitely one you should check out if you haven't been looking into it. Uh, we've been, the past couple of projects we've worked on, uh, not even just for the fly through or the walk through, kind of that fluid gaming environment element that it has, which is magical, by the way, even if you don't do that with a customer because they're not going to sit down with you and, and you know, do that, uh, just for taking still renderings and being able to kind of like fly around and then frame the view and screenshot it. Uh, it's pretty, pretty great for that. Um, I don't have too many tips for uh, entourage as far as, you know, people walking around for scale model, uh, except I, I know a lot of architects are using Lumion. Primarily they're using that. Um, and, and this is just me uh, as an Autodesk reseller. So take it for what I say, but we don't, we don't sell Lumion, but uh, it, it tends to be a very easy to use product. Uh, and because of that, um, it's got some real, real value to an architect who, who may be even doing it for free. You know, they may not be actually getting a fee for their visualization time. And so in that case, something like Lumion makes a lot of sense. So does Inkscape uh, because it can be very rapid. And so you would do all your entourage and everything in the outside software and not populating your model, or if you are doing it in Revit, potentially having a separate model that you put on I've seen people do that in the past. Um, anything on that? Uh, yeah, I've, I've seen it in both. Ahead. I, yeah, if, I've seen it both. If you've got your entourage loaded in your Revit model, you just need to make sure that you've got view templates uh, that are basically turning it off in almost every view so that it's not, uh, you know, part of your, uh, I don't know, your demo plan or whatever, you know, it doesn't, you don't have people showing up in places they shouldn't show up. And I might add as well, I think, because uh, we keep kind of, one of the questions we keep coming back to is file size and a very important thing that, that we stress and that James and I have talked about some of our clients with is that when we're working with them and they have these standards developed for these families and groups and everything that they've got, um, they've got a template, their, their, you know, their starter template file. And one thing that we suggest is that, and, and uh, through CTC tools, which ATG sells, ATG USA, uh, it's called Hive. And what it is, is a content management system in the cloud that lets you store all of your family content, your standards for your company in that in that cloud system, that content cloud, and your employees can get access to that. And as they're working, it works within Revit, basically, that you can pull up your content, find the family you're looking for, and insert it in the model. It doesn't have to be in your initial template. And I think that's a lot of the problems that a lot of architecture firms and companies get started right off the bat is that, well, let's create a template and we're going to throw everything in it that we ever have used. Yeah. And so right off the bat, you're, you're starting off on the wrong foot because you're, you've got everything your company ever has as a standard in that one file, instead of storing it on hive in the cloud, you can have just a blank template with maybe your art, your uh, font standards and your dimension standards and sheet standards set up, but no families for uh, 3D modeling. Walls, uh, or you know, walls can be set up in there, but like yeah. furniture, so system families. Yeah, you can system. even do system families in Hive as well, right? Yes, yeah. yes. And then all of those families are vetted by the BIM manager, which is another great item, right? So you don't That's have. Right. You don't have your designers going in and looking for random files that maybe you have used on a different folder somewhere else, right? Or very specifically, I don't go to Revit City and download a cool looking model of a person <laughs> that has a hundred or has a million polygons in it. Uh, if they get it from Hive, then it's one of your low polygonal approved, uh, you know, pieces of content to be able to drag in like an entourage. And it's not in German. Yeah. <laughs> or, and metric. Met and metric. or metric. Or <laughs> metric. 
that's actually so, a bigger pain. In the so eye. yeah, so that's kind of where you, that's kind of a great place to start though, is if you're wanting to look into that, definitely contact your ATG sales rep because we can, we love to do demos on that because it's such a cool cloud content tool for Revit um, that gets you started right off the bat. And not yeah. just not just content. Now you have Power BI linked into it, allowing for analytics, right? So now That's you can right. start. Now you can start actually doing your investigation. How much megs is my um, file size? Who's uploading it? How long does it take James to open the file on his laptop? Maybe it is the laptop and not the performance of the model. That's I got a bin box, issue. baby. Good. <laughs> <laughs> right. So again, with Hive, you can start taking your modeling to the next level, essentially. Yeah, it, I know we all just put on our Hive sales hat, but that actually solves three of the facets of the question they asked. So we, we had to say it. That's kind of why I wanted to drop that in there because it does. It answers it answers your, your file size. It answers your, your groupings and your families. And, and it answers the bloated, uh, template. the bloated template. Yeah. That one tool can answer all of that. Um. All right, perfect. Um, kind of scrolling through here, um, Anya has some good uh, tips in here as well. You can put PDFs, training videos, you know, um, obviously she's a huge high fan as well and leveraging that um, with regards and, to content. And, ma and materials too, because there was, I think one of the part of that question was about inter interiors and design and materials. You can have your company standard material library on the cloud. You can have Sherwin Williams paint chip library on the cloud. You can have, you know, all those furniture or all those uh, material uh, standards, uh, the, the chips, you can have all that on there that then your team can access to uh, insert the couch. And now let's try this fabric. Well, let's try this fabric and you're not download like james said downloading the entire library into revit from the manufacturer website it's in the yeah. it's in the hive cloud and then you can kind of pick and choose so i'm going to disagree with one thing that brian said everything else 100 percent on it's, it's uh, all good if you use hive to streamline your template i don't think you should remove every rfa family out of it um, i think that the and and this is what i advise people for is the, the question you should ask yourself is, am I almost certainly going to use this family? And if the answer is yes, put it in the template because that's still you know seconds faster than getting it from Hive. And it's gonna be your user's first stop. They're gonna click on the type selector and see if it's there. Uh, and if you still have 50 things in your template, remember that you can hit the type selector and then just start to type part of the name and it will truncate the list inside of Revit for you. A lot of people forget that and they end up scrolling the list like it's Netflix and they get to the bottom and they're like, well, did I see it? And they just, you know, start overlooking <laughs> again. Don't do that. Just type in part of the name. I don't disagree with any of that. <laughs> um, so there was a follow-up question and I don't know that we, um, this is for Kathleen, came in a little bit late, but, um, I don't know that we had a definite answer on this, but we did talk about controlling visibility um, of content. So is there a preference between using work sets to control visibility or view templates? Uh, James mentioned view templates a couple times. So uh, what camp are you, work sets or view templates? If, if you go to the internet for your answer on this, they will, they will give you a range from telling you at, that you may be a bad person for using work sets to, <laughs> to affect visibility all the way to saying, ah, you could do it, but maybe don't do it. Uh, so I'm definitely on the side of believing that you should control your visibility inside of Revit, not using work sets, that work sets should chop up your model geographically. You could do it, but most people that are doing that are, have either transitioned from AutoCAD and in their mind, they think of layers and they start controlling visibility inside of Revit uh, with work sets, treating them like layers. Uh, everybody pretty much will tell you, you could, but there's a better way to do that. Uh, and so normally what you're gonna do is you're gonna control it in one of the three places inside of Revit. 
which are, are just basically overrides. You're going to control it in your object styles is your most macro place. You're going to control it in visibility graphics. If you're a savvy user inside of Revit, you develop view templates to control it at that middle, le middle level in visibility graphics. And then all the way downstream at the most micro level, you can grab individual elements and override their graphics and view. I would use those three solutions rather than using work sets. Um, uh, with the 3D token, going back to uh, another side question, and I'm not sure if we have, uh, might not have the experience in this, but um, with the 3D topo and modeled sidewalks, how do you get the curb and gutter to follow the topo? I like when I've got time on a project to do beautiful stuff like that. Sometimes there's no time and you just offset eight inches and you're like, just line work. I, I hate to say it, but sometimes it's I've done truth. that. If you have time or if you think that you create valuable content and it's worth modeling because you might cut a section anywhere along there and want to see it, then you need to model it. In which case it's actually not that much harder. And the more advanced of a Revit user you are, the faster this part goes too. But you basically just create a sweep and there's several ways to do that as well. Um, and so the easiest way is just going to model it in place. So you go to architecture, hit that down arrow under component. I know I don't have Revit up on screen, but I've done this so many times. I can just tell you what to click. Choose model in place. Uh, choose it. The category doesn't matter, but just choose it as a side element. Uh, and then you need to either pick the path. I usually don't do that, even though it does a great job in 3D. I normally am going to choose the sketch path because it lets you come back to it and make changes later. So if you end up changing the slope, uh, it, it kind of helps you better to make changes to it later. But you need to one time draw the profile for a typical curb and gutter. That should take you five minutes to have that in your library. And then thereafter, you're just spending a couple of minutes uh, basically doing a model in place, choosing the path and drawing that, that line work that it, it follows. That's how I would do it. I would model it unless someone had a gun to my head and said, finish this in 20 seconds. And I don't care if you should use lines. If they said that, then I'd do lines. And, and another suggestion um, from um, one of the attendees as well is that you could use a rail family for curves if you wanted oh. to, to follow the topo. So that's kind of uh, out of the box thinking of using another tool yeah. for that. So um, that's that's the, that, now that's I, only after Revit 2020. If you've got okay. 2019, it's worth noting that railings don't follow topography prior to that. Uh, okay. And if, you, if you've kind of sworn off stairs uh, because the last time you messed with them was six years ago, uh, be, a, be advised, Revit has come a long way with stairs. They, they behave now in railings. Yeah, it, it, that has been a, a long time coming um, for sure. Um, all right, let's see. You know, I'm just kind of watching the time. We're coming up on about 10 minutes left. Uh, Star Wars question. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just any I'm blue beam questions. I'm not seeing any blue beam questions. This one, um, and we don't have Patrick on the line, but um, how can teams integrate uh, BIM Suite, Dynamo, and other tools into an interior design workflow using the same architectural model or separate link model that can take a project from SD colored plans, drawings to full construction documents with less rework? Um, does anyone have any experience or proven workflow? Hmm. Now, I have a magic wand. So Patrick's been chatting with me. I don't. I think he had something else going on, but he just was chatted something. So I just copy pasted that to him. So let's okay. see. Uh, Patrick, see what he comes. He's a resident Dynamo expert, so we we have to kick it out to him so that we he, don't give you just numbskull advice on it. Yeah, because <laughs> he's uh, he's very talented at Dynamo, and it's something that I'm. Uh, I still, I, I like to say that I, I, I've never, I've been doing this for, well, Revit for 13 years now, and I've never, I can never say I know everything about Revit, and I learn, I try to learn something new every day in Revit. You're never going to master Revit. There's always two or three ways to do one thing, and to find out a new way to do something is always a nice discovery. Yeah, sure. and, and this is coming from three guys who's uh, actually, I'll, I'll speak for all four of us, who a large part of our job is actually learning our software better. Uh, and, and I'm not juggling, you know, eight projects like you guys are. So uh, even 
as devoted to academically trying to get better at it. Uh, we're still, I just learned, you know, when Brian was telling me about, you know, don't copy your groups like that. I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't either. I, I learned something new and I, I think that uh, this is a really good um, forum for everyone to get together and, and talk. I really feel like a lot of value has come out of this. Um, so, and just a kind of a general statement, Wait, wait, uh, I, can, I can partially try to answer her question yeah, before, before we just say, I don't know if Patrick can't answer. He's, he's typing something now, but go ahead. Let's um, hear your answer and then I'll see what Patrick says. No, mine's, no, <laughs> mine's not good. I pay for scissors. <laughs> so I've, I've taught um, probably four different interior design um, outfits, uh, how to utilize Revit. And we haven't really gotten much into automation of it. So I'm, I'm kind of backpedaling on that and saying one thing that you can do because a lot of interior design work is very focused upon uh, which selections and which finishes there are. And the schedules inside of Revit, let's be honest, are, are very crummy. They don't let you copy and paste. They don't let you do basic, basic math functions or, or anything iterative. Uh, and so we've actually been leveraging a CTC tool. To, again, this is me putting a sales hat on. Uh, there is a BIM project suite uh, set of tools uh, like Schedule Excel that basically let you uh, stay inside of Revit do Excel level work of filling, copying, pasting out, finish schedules. You hit save and it pumps that data right back into Revit. And so that's not Dynamo, but that is a way to um, basically leverage third party software to automate uh, a lot of the data side of interior design. And um, yeah, and I, I just wanted to follow up. That's, that's a great recommendation on the Excel for autom automation. Um, if there are any questions in here, I will get a list of all of those. Um, and I may just have, you know, I can have Patrick just follow up um, on some of these questions or if I inadvertently missed some of these as the chats have gone by, um, I'm not trying to ignore your question. We will um, for sure follow up. And uh, speaking of Bluebeam, uh, Michael is one of our resident uh, Bluebeam um, certified instructors. and uh, and I believe James, you are. You kind of went for that. Let's not well. call me certified. I'm just a know-it-all. Okay. okay there you go. <laughs> we'll we'll give you three three letters and it'll be good. Do you recommend printing PDF from Revit via using the Bluebeam add-in, or go to print and select Bluebeam as a printer? Is there a Michael first. So um, with the native out of the box Revit printing abilities you can't really control the setting of the DPI, right? DPI is for your performance dots per inch and what you're gonna be getting out of your performance of your PDF. The larger, more DPI you have, the longer it takes for a PDF to considerably render, right? Especially if you have views with renderings in them. So you have more control over that using the add-in from Bluebeam, whereas you're still printing from the formatted of written rights from Bluebeam if you're using the print from Revit. So I prefer if you want to be more versatile and more pinpointed and granular on how you want your PDFs to print and plot at, I would use the add-in from Bluebeam versus just printing, printing directly from Revit itself. So how does it, uh, does it help you with batch prints? Can you address that one? Um, so batch printing. Because it's real easy to do that through control P. It is, yes. So it, again, the my advice for batch printing and putting the CTC hat on again would be uh, plotter and exporter would be for batch printing, right? So then you have the ability to go through and search for items that you want to print out. Uh, that is the, in my opinion, the best option currently that I've seen for batch printing um, versus the out of the box Revit batch printing option. It's worth pointing out too that there are three different SKUs or flavors of Bluebeam and overwhelmingly most architects or AEC professionals are just getting the standard, which is the bottom tier one. Uh, if you are seeing integration inside of Revit, then that means that you've either got the CAD version, which is the middle tier or the extreme version. Uh, and so I would avail myself of those features. Most architects that are using the uh, Revit add-in are doing it for one feature, which is the 3D PDF. And man, there are precious few architects doing it, and you really should look at that. Uh, if you're, particularly if you're looking at, do we continue purchasing next year uh, Bluebeam standard, or do we look at Bluebeam CAD? 
um, really take a hard look at 3D PDF. That's the killer defining feature for jumping up to the CAD level because it, it lets you protect your assets. So if you don't, if you're, if you're kind of uncomfortable or people in your firm are uncomfortable with sending or shipping out your RVT assets to engineers or landscape architects who are looking at your model and saying, ah, we could use this entourage with a million polygons inside of it. You know, if you, if you don't want stuff harvested, then one way that you can do that is, to, and, and particularly with, you know, sending it, I hate to say this about contractors, but uh, clients or contractors, if you're sending them RVT files, your stuff's kind of in the wind and that's your intellectual property that you developed. You could instead send them a 3D PDF of an area and it works kind of like a section box where you sort of define the area. You could do the whole model and let them spin the whole model if it's just the client and they wanna look at everything, but you can section box down to an individual uh, condition that you want to explore and then you can annotate it with a question or an answer, whatever you need to talk about. And it, it actually creates a globe that sits right where you, uh, the leader pointed and then uh, someone that doesn't even use Bluebeam or Revit or any of that, they just get it on their smartphone. You send them an email with a 3D PDF and it will view in any kind of uh, you know, browser that, that has supports email. They can spin the model, enlarge it. And uh, you can also use it for your site once a week. You know, a lot of times you've got, as an architect, you've got these project meetings and you can actually use it to conduct these project meetings while everybody's in their home, you know, on Zoom. You can just have them click on the 3D PDF you sent out, click on the globe, and it will rotate the, to the orientation of the view you had when you made the note, and it will expand that note out uh, that either answers a question or asks a question or says what a connection is. So 3D PDF is a killer feature that not many people are using uh, to be able to send uh, their answers and ask their questions out to people that they don't want to share Revit models with. And take it a step further also coming from a structural design background, talking to an engineer that doesn't know how to utilize Revit, right? At some point, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Sending them a 3D PDF to conceptualize what the architect's intent is, is a huge feature as well. Sure. Perfect. Uh, over answering these questions. I love it. No, um, is, but but back to uh, the reason why most items can view the 3D PDFs is because Bluebeam Review follows the... Uh-oh. 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 Michael's frozen in an unflattering way. <laughs> and right when he was giving us the secrets. Um... ISO standards of the International there Standard Organization. There he is. Okay, I'm back. There we go. Okay. Um, so Bluebeam Review follows the ISO standards of the International Standard Organization for writing PDFs. So any software that follows the same standard allows you to view their PDFs, which majority of them do. Okay. You got to okay. tell Michael, you're jamming up Zoom. <laughs> All right. So um, we're closing in on our hour. And hey, so Emily. Yeah, real, qu real quick before we end up, let me read yeah. this real quick. Patrick okay. responded on the Dynamo question from Heather. And so let me just read what he wrote. Again, I'm not the expert, so I don't know how much more in depth I can go on this, but he says, I've seen a few workflows specifically for interiors that involve Dynamo. Uh, one that can create interior finished floors based on room boundaries and drawn boundaries. A workflow to help streamline the placing of interior elevations based on a room selection. In most cases, you'll get 80 to 90% of the work done. He's seen Dynamo used to create parametric ceiling designs as well as parametric lighting designs. Uh, for the linked workflows, there are ways we can extract information uh, or the, uh, let's say he kind of typed weird, of the arch model that, or of the arch model that they're linked into, but he doesn't have experience in working in that way. For me, he wants to see when he's working or we're, when ATG, we help with a firm, he wants to see what the firm is doing currently to give a better answer for their process. Okay. So that's no. kind of general. And then he had a question for us, the three of us, Michael, James, and myself real quickly as well. Uh, what is the future of BIM? What are the new technologies you guys are seeing that can impact the future of BIM? So look at that, he's generating content from within our meeting. <laughs> yeah, so that might be kind of a good closer if everyone wants to just give kind of uh, their two cents uh, uh, version, um, thoughts on what is the future of them? I mean, where, where are we headed um, and what are we excited about? And um, I just wanted before I let you guys close with that, um, there's some questions that came in on a lot of the site tools. 
how simple 3D can work back and forth between that. So I'm going to take some of these and I think what we could do is a future webinar on just some of these specific, specific topics and workflows. And so stay tuned for that. I think this is a really great uh, place to get new ideas for content. So yeah, uh, last comments on the future of BIM. And for those that have to jump off and go to another meeting, um, I really appreciate you attending today. So thank you. Future of BIM, final thoughts, BIM thoughts. Are we just going to do a round table? I think yeah. automation. I think yeah. automation is one feature that BIM is going to be created of, right? So true BIM building information modeling system. I want the final word, Brian. Okay. Okay. Um, I, and I'm a movie buff. I always go back to my Norda report. I, uh, I think technology, BIM started, and I'll be, I'll try to be brief. BIM started really as of, of what the title is, BIM information, you know, modeling that it's, we were intended to use this as a construction tool to categorize and, and, track everything that's within that construction model and in a general sense it's happened but in a specific sense it's really hard to track all the little nuts and bolts and everything else that happens within a construction so to a, a larger sense BIM is kind of doing what it was designed to do which is allowing us as architects and con contractors to create models that we can build buildings off of so when you take that aspect and then you go, well, what's the next step? Well, I think we've kind of, it's done what it was intended to do, which was categorize all the materials. Now what's the next thing that we can do with it? Well, James and I've seen it with Enscape and that is virtual reality modeling. And that's kind of why I was referring to uh, minority report because that aspect is really close Enscape now has part of their uh part of their service in their in their program you can actually export a virtual reality model of your space that you're trying to show your client um, now the manipulation within that isn't there yet but i really think that we're getting super close to bim virtual vr modeling to where I can be wearing glasses and building something and constructing a countertop or a detail uh, within within 3D virtual reality. That's my prediction. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so I've, I've got a uh, short-term, mid-term, long-term here and it kind of, honestly, it gets a little bleak. So I'll, it may not be the best note to end on, but- Oh no, we should go. Go ahead. Um, so, I mean, I think about this a lot, actually, and, and I actually sometimes speak on it. Uh, in the short term, what we're seeing from uh, contractors is they're, they are able now to create shop fabrications. They're able to take precisely modeled things that we are having more capability of precisely modeling them as they should be, or sometimes they laugh at the architect's model and they redo it themselves real quickly based off of that. Uh, but they've got the ability now to prefab, save a lot of money for the customer or make a lot of money by doing it in a cheaper way. And Autodesk is very focused on enabling automation or prefabrication. Uh, the second dynamic, the medium range is, is probably more of what Patrick was asking because this is his space, which is dynamo, which is computational BIM, which is the computers starting to rise up and over. I mean, uh, the computers starting to handle some of the design iteration process. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to kind of talk about that one last. Let me address the, the two that you guys kind of talked a bit about most. And I said I'd be brief, or you said you'd be brief. VR is, is kind of, uh, it just started things for us, really. And a lot of architects have set VR down like it was a Wii, you know, and, and their, their grandma's done playing with it because uh, the customers aren't doing it or they don't have a good workflow to be able to throw things into VR and then catapult themselves farther into design development and they're sick of scrapping the model or whatever their broken workflow is. So VR is suffering right now. It's not really seeing the growth that we thought it would see. What we are seeing instead is the rise of augmented reality. Some people are calling that mixed reality depending upon the technicality of that. Tune in to Josh Radel if you want to hear more about uh, this particular thing. But basically, augmented reality is more like minority report, where it's gesture based, where you're seeing the real world and you're seeing uh, your design superimposed over it. The great thing about architects and designers like engineers is that it lets you 
um, design in a different way. Instead of just visualizing it with blinders on, which is what virtual reality is, uh, this is letting you actually set your design on a tabletop and you know grab and expand it, selecting an element, rotating it, throwing it away, doing very um, very intuitive things. It's almost a step back towards like pen drawing in that way, kind of a romantic gesture based way of design. Long term. Sorry, it's a long-winded answer. Uh, Long-term, the answer uh, is more into generative design, computational BIM, and the architect's role shrinking and eroding further and further, or at least transforming in such a way that it's scary to me. It scares the pants off of me, honestly, because we've been watching for decades where architects are sort of retreating their services in and saying, well, all I do is uh, specify the basis of design, and I do that through my drawings, and so I'm not going to model it. I'm not going to pump data into my model because I, I can't figure out a way to get paid for that. Uh, but basically what is happening is an unraveling of BIM. So if BIM is allowing us to hyper specifically specify what everything is and turn what maybe should be a 20 page sheet set into a 200 page sheet set uh, easily, then what we're seeing with computational BIM is a way to basically uh, define parameters of success. This is too little, this is too much. I, I want somewhere in between. And so the architect is basically going to be setting up, eventually setting up more and more rules. And you can start dabbling in that in Dynamo now, uh, but then you turn it over to the computer and let it run hundreds of thousands of iterations and it turns up 100 successful ones that accomplish all the things that you said were success and it shows you the 100 successes, shows you things you never would have dreamed of with like matri matrices of uh, elements moving through where there's entire areas cut out because you don't need the material for it or the bulk of it. Uh, and then you choose the, the ones that you like best out of that, which eventually transforms the architect's role more into that of a curator uh, or a more of a passive designer. That's the bleak side of it. Maybe it's exciting, but scares the, the pants off of me. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying for automation, right? Because then you can use your analysis program that's going to give you those thousand options for the best derivative of light reflecting, right? So yeah, energy analysis. Right. And why did we go to school for five years and then three <laughs> years of internship to have it taken away by uh, an, an AI analysis program. Right, and it, it eventually, and this is where it has to go this way, and eventually it takes the architect out of the role of production and puts them much more in the creative role and in the curator of design role uh, than in the, man, I have to get this thing drawn, so let me make a bunch of compromises so that we finish by the deadline. That's exciting. Um, I know it, it's a little scary, but um, I, I think it's going to be an interesting journey that hopefully we'll all be here to see. So again, I love that you, question. Yeah, yeah, it was a great, it was a great, uh, it was a great uh, finisher. So we'll close with that. Again, thank you all for joining us, and thank you for being panelists today and uh, uh, answering the questions for everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you guys.